very important book discussion on Ambassador Shivshankar Menon's book on choices inside the making of India's foreign policy. I think the book is extremely topical, not simply because of its content, but also because the issue of choices is always something which faces for policymakers, especially in foreign policy, and especially at a time like this, when there is so much change happening in the international situation. <clears throat> I think nobody on this panel needs any introduction, so I'm not even going to try. So you have a, a brief description of the two discussants and the extremely important positions they've held. And of course, what is missing on the screen is that Shankar was also our ambassador in Sri Lanka, in Israel, our High Commission in Pakistan, and an ambassador in China. So I think I'm not going to stand between you and the, the, the author and the panelists. So the format is going to be that they will each speak for about 15 minutes, and then we'll throw it open for question answers. And depending on how many questions there are, we can actually go on till 5 o'clock. So I think be, be ready with your questions, because you will seldom get a panel of this nature, I think, on foreign policy. With those words, a very warm welcome once again. Shankar, the floor is yours. Thank you, Nalin. Thank you for this opportunity to be back among one's colleagues, really, in a sense, and to be among so many friends. And thank you, Sham and Ranan, for agreeing to discuss it. I'm glad I'm speaking before you rather than after you. Uh, I suppose I, I owe you an explanation for why I chose to write this book. In the spring of 2015, I was running a study group on Indian foreign policy in, in Harvard. And I would introduce a topic for about 40 minutes, and then for the rest of the two hours, we'd discuss it in the group. About, uh, and it was students from every sort of faculty, government, law, history, you name it, and from across the world, from Argentina to Uzbekistan to Mongolia to... But about half of them were Indians or Chinese, either first, second, third generation. But, and when we got to 2611, and India's decision not to use overt military force. Uh, there were about 60 people, 60 plus people in the room, and the first one to stand up after I'd spoken said, my father was killed in 2611. How could you not? And then spoke for five minutes, and I thought, you know, finish this class. But then it took off, this, this discussion, and went on two hours, two, and two hours, 15, two and a half hours. After two hours, 45 minutes, I had to say, go home. Go away. But the overwhelming majority of these young people uh, felt that actually the decision was right, which amazed me. I didn't expect this. This was counterintuitive for me. But more than that, it was the quality of the discussion, the fact that everybody was prepared to engage in this discussion. So I thought, if people are so interested, people from so many different backgrounds, different countries are interested, this is maybe worth putting down. Not, and that's the whole point of the book, not that there's a right or wrong, true or false, win, lose, choice uh, in these cases, in foreign policy cases, but that it's worth going through the process of arguing it out. So uh, in effect, what I tried to do was to leave out what the journalists and some of the reviewers say I should have put in, try to leave out the personal, the first person singular, and to just outline the issues. And then not to come to any conclusion saying which was right or wrong. And I chose five, really, for the book. One was, of course, the Border Peace and Tranquility Agreement with China in 1993, where within 30, 31 years of, of the war, and Parliament saying that every inch of territory we will get back, we actually signed a legally binding commitment on both sides to respect the status quo and not to change it with the use of military force, without prejudice to where each side thought the boundary might lie, but that we'd maintain the status quo. That's really quite a big jump if you think of it. And it's, it's a big decision, it's a big choice. The second was the civil nuclear, which, frankly, Sham did all the hard work. I got to do some of the negotiation after him, uh, because I only came to it halfway when we were negotiating the 123 and when we were going to the NSG and so on. Uh, and then 2611, why didn't we use overt military force in response? Uh, and Sri Lanka, the last six months of Prabhakaran of the LTT as an effective military force in 2009, 
where our strategic interests, our domestic political interests, our humanitarian instincts all pull you in different in directions. And, and lastly, no first use. I mean, why do you have a weapon and say you won't use it? That's not something that for the layman makes much sense. And the end result of that, as I said, was not so much to say this was right or this was wrong, but to see how one thinks about these issues. Because as all of you know, you know, you make policy in a fog, in the rush of events. As somebody said that, you know, history is written with, with a very clear rear view mirror, but you're actually making policy and decisions with a foggy windshield, which, and that's really the problem in these cases. Unfortunately, the public thinks of foreign policy today as a T20 match, that every ball is a wicket or a six, and nothing less will satisfy them. And every day the media is busy saying, we won, we lost, we're winning, we're losing. Uh, so one point of the book, really, is to try and move us away from that kind of discussion, at least among people who, who take these things seriously. Finally, the book draws a few inferences about what kind of power India is and will be. Uh, and my answer to the question of whether India has a strategic culture or not, a term that, frankly, I'm a little uncomfortable with, because the moment you start talking about strategic culture, it's almost deterministic, that your choices are determined by what has come before and, and what you believe. I mean, uh, frankly, but, but please read the book, because my own sense is there is an Indian way in foreign policy, uh, but that we still have a big internal discussion on what kind of power we want to be. Because we will be a great power. That, to my mind, will happen. But what kind of power, how we will choose to use that power, I think that's still an internal argument that we haven't quite settled. My, my choice is simple, as Gandhiji used to say, true power speaks softly. It has no reason to shout. Uh, but my own sense is that India has always behaved as a realist, even though our rhetoric may not suggest that. We love to use the moralistic, and, and that we have been strategically bold but tactically cautious. And this is right from the beginning. And part of the caution, the tactical caution, is frankly because our means of implementation are very underdeveloped. We're not very good at actually following through and actually getting things done on the ground, and that's one of the problems. But strategically, these five choices, yes, but even going back to non-alignment, to, to those choices, those were brave choices, and they were big strategic choices that we've consistently made. Uh, the actual process of foreign policy making has been personality driven. I think the role of the prime minister in India in making foreign policy has always been very, very high, probably unique. I can't think of another power where, where it's as. And, but I'm not sure how we are going to behave. Nalin said that things have changed. We are today in an age of ultranationalism. And we are going to be faced with choices which are going to be much more difficult. One of the reviewers, I think, of the book said that this book is of a time which is, which is past. And it is true. It is of its time. I'm not sure how much of it is past, how much of it is relevant. That, frankly, you are the best judges of that. Uh, the book also, I mean, the process of writing it also threw up several other questions, which I haven't actually covered in the book, uh, because a lot of the book actually ends up dealing with the use of force and the utility of force. 2611, we didn't. 2009, Sri Lanka force worked. It actually did eliminate the LTT as an effective terrorist military group. Uh, but the, and China runs through it, something that I didn't realize until I had written the book and then realized that it actually runs right through the book. But what it doesn't do, which actually comes out in the course of it, is the whole question of morality and ethics and foreign policy and to what extent are you driven or conditioned, at least, by the morality of what you're doing. Uh, can you justify all acts of state? I mean, how do you, uh, is killing one, you know, for the sake of the many, is that how, I mean, those questions, frankly, I don't get into. I, I have stayed clear of. The, you 
Now, it is a practitioner's book. It doesn't try to do anything much for IR theory because, frankly, I think theory is pretty remote from what most of us do, and since most of us here are practitioners. And, but I, it's, it's out there. I, I do hope that you get to you read it and that you enjoy it. I was surprised, frankly, by the generosity of the comments and the reviews that, that it's received so far. I mean, the first one was my son-in-law who told me it's shockingly readable, which I, I will treat as a compliment. I, I, somebody else told me, oh, it's very brave and honest, which, as you know, are two words that you should never use with either a politician or a diplomat. Because my first reaction, my god, have I said something wrong in here? And then I said, this is an absolutely abnormal reaction. Somebody tells you you're being honest, it's a compliment. Normal society. It's only among us that this is you know, that you react, that our reactions have become so, so warped. But I leave it to you. I hope you enjoy the book. Buy it in large numbers, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think uh, you have heard uh, the author, and so whatever I say will be anticlimactic. I told him right in the beginning, he said he's going to speak for 15 minutes, and I said I'll speak for 20 because he knows what he's speaking about. But I'll, <laughs> I'll speak as I, you know, I read the book. First thing I'll tell you about the book is it's, it is actually eminently readable. I uh, started that yesterday, and in two sessions I finished that book, and I jotted down some points. So I'll just mention that. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's complex issues are, uh, you know, simplified in his book, but nuances are retained. And it's, uh, it's uh, you know, very clear, cogent, and uh, coherent narrative. Uh, above all, it's, uh, it's a thought-provoking book. And uh, uh, the language is something which uh, everyone can understand. And what he said about, you know, being honest and, you know, straightforward, uh, that's something which is a, a common misconception because diplomats actually have to be because credibility is the key. But not many people expect that. So, so when you, even in diplomaties, when you say it's a candid conversation, means this uh, must have been quite a lot of fireworks. And so, so that, but the, I was quite taken by the title of the book, which is Choices. Because, you know, I spent more time in Moscow than in Delhi, really, you know, something like about 14 years uh, in, during my service life. And in Russia, the first word you learn is Ocheret, uh, which is a cue. Uh, and, but at the end of the queue, there's no choice. You take it or leave it. <laughs> and, and another thing, and I found that that also, I mean, that was there in Tsarist Russia, Communist Russia, and a lot of other things. But, but it's, a, it's a, you know, where advertisements used to be censored more than, you know, the political writings, etc. Because, uh, and you had the, you know, you had the word order, which is always there, pariyada, rather than. Vibar, Vibar means choice, but Vibar also means elections, which is also unknown, but now it's coming there. But our, it's quite strange that in our free society, where you have you know, so much of chaos and uh, it's so noisy, but yet as a state and as a people, we try to avoid choices. It's like in, uh, in the United States, you know, where they, the typical American English, they say use both lanes. So what our people do is not, they mean use either lane. We actually straddle both lanes or crisscross. So, so that is a part of our, uh, our psyche. And so any change, we choose what is called, you know, the middle path. That is neither here nor there. And we tend to treat any changes with suspicion at best or regarded as subversive, more realistically, to any change. And seek consensus. Consensus means the least common denominator, not necessarily the optimum choice. And, and some of these examples point out there are instances where, you know, I mean, Shankar, you point out rightly that sometimes you have the leadership, the courage, the foresight to make what he says are bold decisions, but very cautious and snail paste in implementation. So, and, uh, so uh, with this, uh, that is an overall framework in this book. 
But I'll just make a few comments, just in passing, because uh, it might it not, may not be as coherent as you know Shankar made them. Uh, but uh, like on China, the focus is on basically on the ninety three. Uh, peace and Tranquility Agreement, Peace and Tranquility in border, border areas. Now, this aspect, and he points out of fascinating, you know, discussions which, with Mr. P. V. Narsimharao, uh, preceded by a conversation with uh, Foreign Secretary Mani Dixit. Uh, but just let me tell you, I think, um, that the Rajiv Gandhi visit, I think it was his most important, the most far-reaching, and timely initiative we took, whether it's in terms of foreign policy, security policy, or even our economic policy, our economy at that particular stage, which was really at the turning point. And there was no consensus. There was no consensus at all on the visit. The very strong opposition within the government, outside the government, and within the ruling party. In fact, the principal opposition was within the ruling party. Uh, like it happens, and that is another thing which runs throughout all these major initiatives, right from Sri Lanka, which is what is the word used? Misadventure. People still don't know. What were the terms? Because they didn't think of an alternative. What was the alternative? Mostly these choices, as you point out, are not between good and bad. They are between bad and worse. You are presented with certain choices all the time. So, so that, uh, but one thing is there that, you know, unfortunately what happened is that we did not follow up. Initially, uh, Prime Minister Rajiv Gandhi had thought that he's going to follow that up, but then there were distractions, distractions of Bofors, distraction of, of um, Shah Banu, of uh, Shilanyas, and so forth. And uh, the momentum was lost. We said that we'll take it up later. And so it was not only with China, so it was with the roadmap for uh, recognition, full diplomatic uh, relations with Israel, which was already, the path was laid out. And and a number of other things, in, including, very importantly, economic reforms. Some things were done in technology missions, etc., but this was not followed up. And, uh, and what happened with Nassim Rao, and I think he's not given enough credit, he's picked up all the threads, all these, and, he, and followed them up, and that comes out pretty well in the uh, peace and tranquility in border areas, that agreement. But he also initially thought, and those were several conversations I had with him in, uh, in July 91, in, uh, in Caracas, in, later on in November 91, 92, Security Council Summit, etc., a number of times. But basically, he said that, look, I would like to take them both up, but the second one I'll have to keep pending because I've got enough on my plate at that particular point of time. And then later on, uh, and he said that, you know, with the growing asymmetry, uh, it might become more difficult. That time, if you remember, I think it was, uh, if I'm not mistaken, the difference between our GDP of uh, India and China was in 88 when he went. It was roughly, you know, we had about mm, 300 billion and China was about 400 billion, you know, with some change here and there. By 98, when he finally cleared it, uh, he said, go ahead with both. Uh, it was, it was uh, different. It was um, something like about... Uh, uh, we have 400, and China was about uh, significantly more at that time. It had become not quite twice, but almost twice. So, and he realized that with with the passage of years, the difficulty which we had of getting consensus on our economic reforms, that asymmetry would grow, and as it grew, it would become more difficult. But as it happens, I mean, he lost that election, and it was a different matter. I was supposed to go there and, you know, take up my assignment in China as ambassador. And that assignment was cancelled. And uh, the rest, uh, that is just uh, one part of uh, one comment I had to make. The other was that uh, there's, you know, Russia did not need a big nudge to be pushed in the direction of China. Uh, because uh, that was there and there was a change from the brezhnev Suslov period to from the time of Andropov, the change had taken place. <clears throat> and Gorbachev's visit in 1989 was supposed to be the culmination of that. So the changes had taken place very clearly there. And, uh, uh, and it was revealed in many ways. I don't want to go into it. 
And second thing is I'm not sure also that the Chinese position hardened as a result of progress made on the India-US nuclear deal. I'm not quite sure of that because it was not reflected there, at least, uh, where we had very, very close consultations. On the civil nuclear deal, as he said, you know, I, uh, you know, there's nothing, I mean, you have the principal players over here, that's uh, Sham Saran and uh, Shankar Menon. Um, and uh, um, my own role was, I don't, uh, was not at all, I mean, partially involved, uh, peripheral in the negotiating. Hmm? No, I was, honestly. And <laughs> uh, but it was not exclusively, my contribution was not exclusively the headless chicken remark. <laughs> <laughs> Though one thing I, I didn't realize, I didn't realize till that stage I knew, I didn't realize it was 97%, as you point out in your book. But I did realize that one comment, there was so much of support in India. I never realized that. The amount of postcards I got, amount of not just other mail, it's incredible. And also, the, some of the people who are speaking, you know, out criticizing, privately ringing up, you know, sorry, Dada, we have to do that, you know. <laughs> Hope you understand. So that was quite amazing. And there we had a very divisive uh, kind of uh, situation over here. But there it was not just uh, in India, but in the Indian American community, including overseas friends of the BGP. Absolutely solid support. Not that because they understood it, you know. For instance, you know, they said, what is this one, two, three agreement about? Is it a countdown or something? I said, no, that countdown normally goes three, two, one. So, <laughs> but it is, we had pushed it up to the end. But it was, they said, look, we don't understand this. What I said, section so-and-so of so-and-so act and all that. They, that didn't make sense. What they understood is very simple terms. And what I'm going to say is completely undiplomatic, improper, is uh, that they said, look, if... Uh, if you have China protesting so vigorously, and the Pakistanis, and also the Iranians, there must be something in it. So <laughs> it was a very simple understanding, and I think it was a wrong understanding because it was not the way we see it. But it was just uh, that part. But the basic point is that what happened was, I think in this business, I think we all knew, and it was very frustrating, that the biggest challenge for us, honestly, was not, I mean, we had done an outstanding job. I'll tell you these two negotiators, and at a later stage, you had Mr. M.K. Naran who came in. They did an absolute outstanding job, but it was going to be frustrated just because of time. Because what had happened was that all these agreements had a procedure in the House of Representatives. And that was a 90-day procedure. And we didn't even, by the time they got through to give the clearance, you had the end of the left UPA, UPA left meeting, people thought, and perhaps rightly so, that it's finished. Because you didn't have enough days even complete the first stage of a three-stage process. That is 30 legislative days in the Congress. You had 15. So you went through it, and I think there was good reason why people thought that they had finished the deal. But the reasons were as follows. Firstly, you know, the 22nd vote, 22nd July vote of confidence followed very quickly by the 1st August IAEA agreement, 7 September NSG waiver, a remarkable feat again by itself, a tremendous work. Uh, but you didn't have the time, you ran out of time. And so by the time we got our act together, Bush's popularity has fallen 20%. And this was immediate aftermath. End August, Hurricane Katrina. There was so much of backlash against him, he didn't even attend the Republican Party convention which I attended, because he's not wanted there. That was in the beginning of September. And also, the worst financial crisis, all at the same time. So you didn't even have in that session of the Congress, there were doubts about whether even the budget would be adopted, which is like a vote of account, you know, till the next. So in that thing, to get this in, and at a time when I would like to say, we always like to talk about complete bipartisan support. Actually, it was not there. It was very partisan. And we are uncertain, absolutely uncertain. And it was a very close call. And also another factor I'd like to mention that there's not a possibility, which you refer to, Shankar, but certainty that no president, that was Obama or McCain, just told to us very 
clearly, and I heard it directly, would pursue this. So he had effectively killed it. So what he did in these circumstances was just took a calculated risk and brought it through under a rules, uh, a very rare procedure to suspend the rules of the House, and which requires a two-third majority, and we just got it through. But what I'm trying to say is it was not to say that it's, it's partisan, but out of the 117 negative votes, 109, that's 93 percent, were democratic. So, so, at the, so what had happened was that we got it through. And another aspect I'd like to bring out again, just a small uh, observation, that what was the difference was felt like during the pursuit of the current NSG, you know, I mean, membership. Earlier that time it was exemption. That you had the president and the administration fully behind. And they, were, they, they took personal ownership of it. They were making calls. They are picking up the phone, last moment calls to heads of state and government. On the very eve of that, the difference is this time you didn't have that, you know, in the pursuit of these goals. But that I just thought I'll uh, make uh, so, and uh, uh, these brief observations. And there were other uh, issues also involved, and I wouldn't like to go into that in detail, even on, on whether it's on Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka, as I said, it was perceived as a misadventure. Uh, a lot of people don't know that, for instance, even the elections at that time basically were on two issues. Uh, Mr. V.P. Singh's plank, I had worked with him also. I had worked with Rajiv Gandhi, I worked with V.P. Singh, and then with Chandrasekhar, Prime Minister. At that time, the election plank, as you remember, were two issues. Get our boys back from Sri Lanka and uncover Bofors. You know, the secret account, I've got the number, the cover-up is going to end. But actually, let's say on Sri Lanka, what really happened? Really what happened was... The first letter, which was sent to Prema Dasa, President Prema Dasa, the first letter itself, I had put, you know, in the spirit of the Indo-Sri Lankan agreement, it was cut out by B.P. Singh and said, no, it has to be on the basis of. And that became the mantra. And what was done is quite incredible. You had the 13th Amendment. I don't recall. We, you know, speak about right to protect, etc., and all that. Any country, I mean, with the exception perhaps of uh, post-war Japan and Germany, where you actually had a constitutional amendment as a result of a bilateral agreement. And that's our best hope today for stability there uh, in that area. But there are many other nuances I won't like to go into. But uh, on other aspects, and, and also we were incidentally, uh, we knew in advance that uh, President Premadasa will oppose that as soon as he's elected. But he didn't want his election. His elections, he thought, would be not quite legitimate without the, a big chunk of the country not voting. So we knew exactly in advance that he's going to make this an election issue. But at the same time, you had a larger interest beyond ourselves that is in, the, in a peaceful environment there. So we went along with taking a lot of the criticism. But there are uh, other very various other dimensions. I would not like to go into that, on, including on the nuclear issue. Uh, there again, uh, uh, you know, as I said, you know, I'm not a theorist. I'm quite absolutely... Uh, incompetent to comment on it. But I happen to be directly involved from the beginning. He's referred to Arihant, that we used to call it something else, uh, 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 codenamed, but from, since 1982. Uh, and uh, many other projects, uh, uh, whether it's Agni and Brahmos and many other projects. But uh, suffice it to say that uh, this uh, Rajiv Gandhi's initiative on nuclear weapon free world and other things which were. Where was not, uh, it was not preceded by, but it was followed by the, uh, it was, sorry, it was preceded by a decision had been taken earlier on uh, conducting a, you know, thermonuclear, I mean, test capability, and also on um, uh, going ahead full steam with the preparation of warheads for different uh, delivery systems. So, uh, so, and finally, I said, you know, there's one aspect on that. Uh, I was there also during that Bombay attacks. Uh, it was very depressing to be there at that time, to see our, our very, and the, the sheer level of incompetence. Absolutely shameful. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, many various other aspects, we went into that. But there was remarkable cooperation from the United States, not only sympathy, but uh, solid support. Though there are some question marks about Headley, 
about, we also had our Rabindra Singh incident, you know, where, uh, where this person had been given cover to, uh, given refuge by the Americans' intelligence. But there's much more cooperation than uh, is generally known about, but I don't want to go into any operational uh, uh, details in, in that regard. But, and finally, when he ends uh, on one thing, you know, he referred to, there were many suggestions made at that time, including that we should, uh, you know, recall our envoys. And uh, one, I think, was, uh, I think, uh, you know, Dr. Manmohan Singh told me that there was something about uh, postponing a cricket, cricket match also. So he referred to that, uh, you know, where you're talking about, about uh, diplomacy being seen as one of these T20 matches. And, and I, I was remembering at that time, I said, thank God we, uh, China doesn't play cricket. <laughs> but, but thanks a lot. I've spoken much more, as I said, I, as I warned you earlier than I should have. Thank you. Thank you, Nalin, for organizing this uh, very interesting panel discussion, and I'm delighted to be part of this. Um, I think Shankar himself has spoken uh, a great deal about what is really the message that he is trying to deliver through this book. Uh, but he ends by saying that uh, it's not really a message that he wanted to uh, deliver. Uh, but uh, actually um, uh, bring to us uh, some of the dilemmas which uh, face uh, policymakers and uh, leaders. Um, uh, Ronan has uh, has also filled up many of the many of the details. Um, I wanted to um, speak just about uh, a few elements. Um, it's difficult to actually comment about a book by Sri Shankar Menon because, uh, uh, as all of you know, uh, we have had a very long career uh, together. Uh, we served together in uh, Beijing. That was our first first real posting after after our language training. And uh, since then, he has actually followed me in several several positions. Uh, I've cleared the path for him in, in many ways. Um, came, came and received, uh, you know, succeeded me in Beijing. Uh, then I decided to move to Tokyo, and lo and behold, he came to Tokyo. <laughs> and finally, he made it to uh, the Foreign Secretary's post, which many people did not like and think, thought that I had actually also, like before, opened the path for him, uh, which is not true. <laughs> But um, uh, it's, it's um, uh, important uh, to, to reflect back on this journey that we have uh, traveled uh, together because many of the things that he has talked about in the book have a certain personal resonance for me because uh, I have experienced together with him some of those, some of those uh, very important events in India's, uh, India's uh, foreign policy. Uh, let me start with something uh, in, in, in somewhat lighter way. When we were in Beijing in the early 70s, it was still the Cultural Revolution. And I was the head of chancery. I was in charge of administration. I, we had a senior colleague, Santosh Kumar, who's not here, I think. But Santosh uh, and his wife, Lini, uh, once called me and said, you know, we have been having this big problem in our flat. They were on the top floor uh, because uh, every time it rains, uh, you know, the roof leaks. And they had put these buckets, you know, uh, different rooms because there was so much of water coming in. So after with, with great difficulty, since we were not a very friendly country at that time, so it was very difficult to get somebody from the what was then known as the Diplomatic Services Bureau which I'm sure you had a counterpart in the Soviet Union, then Soviet Union. And finally, we managed to get a team to come uh, to actually see uh, you know, where, the, where the leaks were. But this was during, during just, just uh, when it was coming to autumn and winter. So this team came, and they had one of these long sticks. And they went around very seriously, poking the roof in various rooms, 
uh, asking where was the leak and poked around a bit. After having poked around for about uh, 45 minutes or an hour, they very seriously and very gravely sort of turned to me and said, uh, yes, there appear to be leaks. Uh, so I said, yes, uh, that's why we called you. Um, well, you know, the problem is that uh, even though there have been leaks, we don't know where the leaks are unless it is the rainy season. So please call us back when there is a rainy season, when the leaks come, and we will try to deal with it. Uh, so having, <laughs> having learned something about you know, how to deal with a somewhat adversarial China, um, actually, it has been a fascinating journey, uh, you know, dealing with China uh, since then. And I think what uh, Shankar has, has uh, mentioned in his chapter on the Peace and Tranquility Agreement, uh, I'm, I was not so much interested in the Peace and Tranquility Agreement, but I think what insights uh, have emerged in terms of understanding Chinese psychology, understanding Chinese way of dealing with other countries, which really shines through that uh, chapter. I think that's the, that is the uh, value of that uh, chapter. I mean, you can have a narrative, but what does it really show? What does it tell us about what kind of country we are dealing with? Uh, I think that's what is very worthwhile. Second is with respect to, uh, which I thought many of the uh, reviews have not really focused on. One is the dilemmas which you face in dealing with foreign policy issues. Uh, he has pointed out, for example, dealing with Sri Lanka. There is this constant tussle between what so-called real politic demands, and there is a huge humanitarian disaster taking place. No doubt about it. And how do you even though there may be people today who say we should only be a real politic and we should have a completely immoral foreign policy, that's simply not possible. Uh, you know, your, your, your foreign policy, I believe, must have some ethical moorings. Uh, it cannot be completely divorced from that. But anyway, I think what he really brings out is, again, those kind of dilemmas which you are faced with. On the one hand, what do I do to ensure that a threat to India's security interests is eliminated. But at the same time, what do you do to deal with what is a huge humanitarian disaster which is rolling out in front of your eyes? Which you as a democracy with the kind of values you have, how do you deal with that? And no easy answers. That's, I think, the problem. That no matter how much you reflect over it, how much you talk about it, this is a dilemma very difficult to resolve. And I think what that what comes out uh, from this book, which I found was uh, really echoed many occasions where we have faced uh, issues like that. The other uh, aspect which he has uh, brought out, and again something which has been missed out, is the role of leadership. Um, yes, uh, countries act according to their interests. Yes, you can sometimes even predict what countries will do. Uh, if you study what their national interests are. But every now and then, you come to the point where it is you are actually on a knife edge, where you know, it, 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 it takes a leader's decision to, to actually either you roll this way or that way. And very frequently, uh, those, those kind of occasions arise. Uh, how often we face this is sometimes people do not realize, and I think as it was uh, mentioned by Ronan, uh, sometimes the choice is between bad and worse. And nobody will give you credit for having chosen the bad over the worse. You know, everyone thinks there is always a very positive outcome to be had to every dilemma that we face. No, that's not the case. So the role of leadership in terms of making things happen and that is a question of timing. That's a question of judgment. These are not things that you can really learn from IR theory. It is something which arises from within you. You know, I'm afraid this is, this is, this is a art more than, than a craft, I would say. Uh, in that sense, during the uh, you know, negotiations of the nuclear deal, I can recall at least three or four occasions where it was actually 
personal decisions taken by the leaders, sometimes on the part of Bush, sometimes on the part of Manmohan Singh, which actually allowed us to get to where we did finally. If those decisions had not been taken, uh, we would have never got this through. So this is, uh, this is uh, uh, something that we uh, perhaps do not appreciate uh, very much. Uh, Shankar has drawn attention to you know, the uh, Mumbai attacks and would that have been a decision to retaliate? Should we have retaliated? Should we not have retaliated? I happened to be in the Prime Minister's office at that time. I know the kind of pressures that uh, Dr. Manmohan Singh was under. And yet I believe that he made a considered decision. What was that considered decision? He did go about very carefully trying to ascertain, do we have the capability to inflict the kind of damage that we need to on the other side? Two, what is the possibility of retaliation and the scale of retaliation? And are we in a position to deal with that retaliation? What may be other factors which may operate? Having considered all that and that within a very, very short period of time, I think he came to the right decision. But somebody may still say that it was not the right decision. It's a matter of judgment. Uh, so uh, I think uh, uh, the, the role of leadership, what choices they make in the fog of, you know, not war, but in the fog of uh, a crisis, uh, it is something which is very difficult to determine. Lastly, um, you know, uh, I think uh, the point that has been uh, made about what is India's future? And I think Shankar makes, uh, makes uh, a very clear, uh, I think, uh, uh, judgment, if I may say so, that um, it is inevitable that India will emerge as a great power. Uh, it has all the ingredients to emerge as a great power. Uh, I, I am conscious of the fact, and I think uh, Ronin drew attention to that, that there is a huge asymmetry between India and China today. Perhaps that asymmetry may even expand in the coming, coming uh, future. But I be still believe that if there is one country which has the wherewithal in terms of its area, of its population, its uh, human resources, its civilizational attributes, which can actually come to the same level or even surpass China, it is only India today. And don't forget that maybe 30 years ago, if somebody had said that China would be today the second largest economy of the world and be seen as a rival to the United States, people may have laughed at that. So it doesn't mean that because you have an asymmetry, therefore you don't, you just give up. And you, and, and you don't aspire uh, to be there. I think that is the key point. Do we as a nation have the aspiration to be where we want to be? And that is also a matter of choice and a matter of decision. Uh, the fact that there is a consistent, consistent pursuit of strategic autonomy. I know that is a term which many people uh, rubbish these days. Um, I feel that you know, non-alignment was, in fact, a search for strategic autonomy. And I believe if there is one running theme in India's foreign policy ever since it became independent, it is precisely that pursuit of strategic autonomy. How do you ensure that India is today able to take relatively autonomous decisions on issues which are of vital interest to India, not each and every issue? It is not that you have to you know, stand your ground in each and every point, no. Uh, but on issues which we determine are of vital national interest to India, we should be able to take relatively autonomous decisions. Those decisions should not be taken in other capitals. That's what I think strategic autonomy is all about. And I think what really emerges from uh, choices is precisely that consistency of, of objective uh, that India has had. And um, what more can I say except that uh, I, I think every issue that Shankar has, has, has talked about uh, perhaps deserves another book from him. Thank you very much. Thank you, Shah. The floor is now open for questions. Uh, yeah, uh, let me just announce the ground rules, please. Uh, 
welcome sir uh, we will take a group of five questions at a time if that's okay shankar and on and sham no no questions no, no. will be addressed to, to everybody answer. so uh, and but please uh, introduce yourselves because i don't think i know everybody uh, okay professor goshan uh, the the questions could be addressed to anybody but if any of the discussants choose to answer them they will also be able to answer them yeah please uh, ambassador benan you had mentioned about policy being made in the rush of the hour at the same time you talk about choices now even if policies are made in at the rush of the hour there has to be a structure there has to be a framework in place in terms of strategies and in terms of the overall policy visions if one doesn't have that kind of a thing then it becomes a fire brigade approach to crisis so i mean obviously foreign policy when you talk about choices it is essentially an exercise in the choice of ends and means and how do you bridge the gap between the two now if that happens obviously there has to be a framework a policy process as well as a policy science how do you achieve that kind of a sort of an objective and unless one can go through that kind of a structure even you know analysis of an individual's role cannot be isolated from such processes because the information on which the individuals function has to be provided to that individual without that it cannot be so even if it is at the rush of the hour without the structure how can anyone have choices i mean if you could comment on that uh, without any planning in a sense uh, the point i want to put across uh, to the very distinguished uh, collection of personalities at the podium uh, is really that about structure in many countries the process of identification of foreign policy objectives is carried out through the writing of drafts which are publicly debated debated in parliament usually and that results in the setting up setting out of foreign policy options foreign policy choices to use shankar's word we seem to fight shy of this we believe that not saying anything not having an articulated set of foreign policy objectives gives us uh, strategic options perhaps is that really the case i'm struck by the fact that the ministry of external affairs has not for a pretty long time produced a white paper uh, this could be on one or another major issue yes we have the tired old annual reports i hope you won't consider it uh, derogatory that i use that term but they don't really tell us anything how can we be a functioning democracy <clears throat> with an educated public opinion if we fight shy of setting out in broad terms our foreign policy objectives that's my little question to you ambassador indra kumar shankar before coming here i was just looking at the ifs blog and i saw a blog from neelam at desk to you yeah. and the last line of blog says the china's unease about the rise of india will determine china's policy about india in future but don't you think it's a mutual thing we have been uneasy about china's rise for many years when you were nsa i remember at one occasion prime minister narmon singh said i think asian summit that we are very concerned about the increasing assertiveness of china we would like to comment and my second question is the, all the choices you are referred to what lessons have been learned from these choices thank you you should we take them now we take yeah, them mm -hmm. now this uh, is because we have one yeah. okay mm -hmm. we'll take the second lot later on please please shankar why don't you start then well, we I'll, I'll, about those two about an objectives and do we why <coughs> don't we have a mission statement i mean you know if you look at other 
long established foreign offices and so on, they keep producing a national security strategy, a national this, that, an intelligence in estimate every five years, they do. Uh, you know, I think part of the reason for us is because, frankly, for India, given our position and where we've been, our mission statement is basically simple as for a foreign policy. Our job is to transform India. There's too many poor people, there's too many of illiterate, there's too much disease. We are an underdeveloped country. We don't use the word anymore because it's not politically correct, but it's a fact. And that's what foreign policy has to serve. It has to enable the transformation of India. And I think that is the only criterion which we can really apply. Now, you can write a huge mission statement based on that one statement. And I think people have. I mean, there have been whole books and so on. But look at the experience of the countries who do have a mission statement for the Foreign Office and who do all this. I think it was Bob Gates who said that, you know, yes, we issue a national security strategy every four years, but I have never ever looked at it afterwards when I'm actually making a decision or doing anything. And I think that is the fate of all manifestos, of all mission statements. And if you look at it in practice, yes, it's a useful exercise to clarify your thinking if you're not clear about what you're doing. But in our case, I think our ultimate goal is quite clear. Now, at the tactical level, I agree with you 100%. What we don't do is then do the tactical explanation of what does this mean in practice? in the individual relationships that we handle, on the big issues that we handle, what's the relative priority between, say, energy security, counter-terrorism, or dealing with cross-border terrorism, or these are the issues that we don't actually do. And at the tactical level, I agree with you 100%, that we need much clearer statements in public, because now our life has got much more complicated than it was until the 70s or even until the 80s. Today, we have agency in the international system. Today, we have a certain level of power which we can exercise. And we do have to, we have therefore much tougher choices, as I say, to make. And that part, I agree with you. But I don't think, frankly, that I think we need to draw some balance here. It's not just a question of, of keeping tactical flexibility and I can respond to everything pragmatically if it suits me. No. Because if you look at the behavior over time, I think most people would say we have been fairly consistent. Uh, even without producing every four months, uh, four years, or every five years, some some such statement, uh, process is a real problem, because uh, if you look at process in foreign policy and national security process in India, that is actually the one part of government which has evolved the most over time. Internal security, internal politics. Frankly, we have not been self-conscious. But if you look at what we did, and a lot of it is a response to crisis, there's no question. When you have the 62 war, you change your intelligence, you create an external intelligence agency. You do army reform after both after 62 and after 65, and, each, and so on and so forth. I mean, you can go through, we went through Cargill, we did a huge review of especially external security. You set up a national security council. I mean, that... But if you look at the processes that we follow, and most of these are relatively recent, actually, we have actually changed those processes. But we have not done the same on the internal side, either internal security <coughs> or in terms of linking internal with external policy. And you see that confusion in when we deal with Bangladesh, for instance, when we deal with Sri Lanka, when it comes to actual cross-border issues with Nepal, you see that confusion in practice, the absence of a thought through or an evolving process, because process cannot be sacrosanct. It can't be the same forever. We'll have to. So I, I take your point, but I think it's much more valid for at that level of what do we actually. So now, you know, I chose, I use choices for a reason, because the trouble is that <coughs> we like to say options. Now, options is, has a pseudo scientific ring to it. It sounds as though, you know, I know all these options and we've got it all worked out. But that's not how it ever works. All of you know. You've been in these positions. You know how it actually works. And that's really why I chose choices. And, uh, but as I said, I don't think that there are huge strategic choices for India now. I think maybe for in the longer term future, if you want to change your strategic goal and objectives, that may be later. But today, we're still doing basically what we have been trying to do for several years in the past. About Surinder's question about China's unease. I think the unease in India is basically because 
China is the only great power that even verbally doesn't seem to accept the rise of India or to accept that India has a right to be a great power and so on. And I think that is the source of the unease in India. For China, however, it, uh, if you look at Chinese behavior with us, frankly, they pay us the compliment of taking us pretty seriously now. Uh, many of the things we object to, which cause us pain and that we object to, are in some ways flattering because it means that they take you seriously enough to actually make your life difficult for you. But I, but I wouldn't make too much of this. I mean, the Chinese have a fairly pragmatic tradition of dealing with the rest of the world. They've shown it. I mean, they, they've gone from, you know, from an alliance with the Soviet Union <coughs> against the U.S., from a, a de facto alliance with the U.S. against the Soviets and then the Russians, and now working with the Russians, et cetera, et cetera. So, and so have we. I mean, I try and argue in the book that we've been fairly realist about how we deal with the rest of the world. So I wouldn't make too much of the unease. I, I think it's a question of really how, how our interests are served together. And I mean, I, I do think that, that it's not an impossible task for India and China to actually not necessarily settle all their problems, but to manage their differences and to reconcile. And I don't see a fundamental difference in core interests, except in the periphery where we rub up against each other, where we have to do a lot of work in, in trying to sort that out? Uh, no, not really. I think, uh, I think Shankar has spelled it out, you know, because that's our main... I think if you read the book, I think none of them will be clear because it poses a lot of questions. It prompts you to think. Uh, and that's the main purpose. I'd, I'd say that really, read the book, it's really worth it. It's one of the best I've ever come across. Uh, what he says is very true, and this we have not got our act together, even in terms of processes. You know, for instance, when I refer to like even the China visit or any of these events, honestly, it had to do with the either our social, political stability, our, our polity, our diverse and federal polity, whether it's in Sri Lanka, events in Bangladesh, or anywhere around, including China, uh, what he referred to internal security. One of the fallout was, you know, I mean, one of the fallout of the 88 visit was, you know, this. Uh, Interference in the Northeast became pronounced less. But it's not a straightforward kind of thing. What he pointed out was that, you know, we have not got our act together. For instance, even on commercial economic issues, it is being handled in silos over here. Whereas elsewhere, and, you know, the Ambassador Rana will know that, you know, other, uh, many other countries have incorporated, let's say, the Ministry of Foreign Trade or Department of Foreign Trade in the Foreign Office. If you take the Sherpas, G20 Sherpas, you'll have two-thirds of them are diplomats. We are, again, a glorious exception. So, you know, we have not got that together institutionally, but what he said about, you know, uh, papers, strategy papers, uh, white papers, etc. cetera, uh, one has prepared some of them oneself some years back. But let me tell you, nobody reads them <laughs> because they're not relevant. Even all like Moraji Desai was honest about it when he was asked about the manifesto. He said, not manifesto, I have not read it. So, so because, you know, I mean, people don't read that. And he's pointed out Robert Gates, for instance. You think he's revealed everything? Most of the things which most of us know who have served in Washington, he's not talked about everything. It's all, not all <coughs> transparent, these memoirs. We should have no illusions about that. Okay, Ambassador Mukherjee. Thank you, Nalin. I had just one comment and one question for Ambassador Menon. Uh, my comment was that perhaps uh, given what you've covered in your book, the title could have been dilemmas rather than choices because what you've outlined sometimes would appear to be a strategic dilemma, an intellectual <coughs> dilemma rather than a choice. Um, and that flows out of the kind of position that we are presently are in in the international community. My question, and I'm sure that won't surprise you because we've discussed this privately, is that you've talked about strategic autonomy. You said that rightly that we are today in a position where we can take a decision because we are non-aligned. Now, we have a non-aligned status. We are, we are in a position, you have been supportive of non-alignment. Um, do you not feel that since choices are all about also moving with time and moving with a changing international order and of finding uh, supporters for our national security interests, that the time has now come for us to leave non-alignment aside, which would be a difficult choice, or a dilemma, whatever you wish to call it, and move to a policy of strategic alignment, because then we would be in a better position to defend our national interests 
on the basis of that strategic alignment rather than a strategic autonomy based on old strategic habits like non-alignment, which may not anymore serve our national security interests in this day and age. So I'm sorry it was a little long, but <laughs> we've discussed it before. And thank you, on that. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Shankar. I have read your book from in intro to index. And um, the very good reading. Compliments to you. But I'll agree with <laughs> Ambassador Sen that the title could have been different. Uh, she said, uh, dilemmas, uh, may I suggest responses, but it's up to you. I don't know how would you look at them. Uh, secondly, the I get a feeling, and I may be wrong, that while you have beautifully described the what of the choices, why of the choices are still kept with you to some extent. And one feels that uh, I we, we wish we could, uh, we could get uh, to know more of it. On Sri Lanka chapter, uh, not only India, that is on our side, but various other countries tried, it, tried and pleaded with Rajapaksha on the humanitarian aspect. And it seems he had been assuring almost everybody that yes, we will take care of it. And he didn't. Now, one of the explanation which I came across is the gap between him and his brother. You haven't brought it out. But how would you reflect on that in case? And, and lastly, uh, at least on two of the choices, Pakistan and Sri Lanka, uh, now keep your book out and say whether we made the right, cho right choices. I know you have said right, wrong, you don't want to get in, but I would want you to get in if you can. Dr. Pankaj Ha, your turn will come. I have a big list. I just want to highlight three basic uh, words. Uh, I'm with ICWA. Fundamentals, parameters, and barometer. I'm talking in the context of military rule and the resurgence of democracy. Given diplomacy always have certain tough choices to make, whether the military rule will survive or the democracy icon will come back. We have made certain choices. So I just wanted to know what exactly are the parameters and which are the break-even point to decide on this. Thank you. Uh, Ambassador Rajwan, your turn will come. Yes. Uh, I know what you said, uh, that uh, India face, faces a deficit of strategic choices. My question really is that uh, I think what Bhaspati said was dilemmas. We face many dilemmas in our neighborhood now. In the South China Seas or the Indo-Pacific, suddenly the climate seems to have gone from bad to worse as far as our options vis-a-vis -vis China are concerned. Similarly, in the West, uh, we are getting into a position where Russia, our traditional friend, has begun to actually get closer to Pakistan as far as Afghanistan is concerned and in the other, other areas. And this is combined by Trump admiring India's friendship with India. We seem to be getting into a tighter embrace with USC, if that is possible with Trump. My question to you is that given this shifting international scenario, what are the choices we have now in the future? I think it's a bit of a crystal gazing, particularly in South China Seas or the Indo-Pacific. Thank you. About dilemma, not choice, or call it <coughs> responses, I, you know, I think that's, that's a matter of choice. <laughs> 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 uh, but, when I, but the serious point I think that you made about, you know, shouldn't we opt for strategic alignment? By the way, I never say that non-alignment is what gives us this, that, or the other. And I've never said it's just a policy. It's a tool. Uh, you know, it's, it's a means to an end. I mean, strategic autonomy is an end. But non-alignment is just, you know, something you use to achieve that. And if it works to get you there, good. If it doesn't work, don't use it. I mean, that's, that's my attitude, too. So just to be clear where I... But about strategic alignment, why do I think strategic alignment is not really the answer for us? For a simple reason. Show me another country that shares your interests. If there were one which shared your interests in your territorial integrity, in your development, your rise, your transformation, then I'd say align with them. But there isn't anybody. Nobody shares your history. Nobody shares your geography. There isn't another country on earth that looks like you. You know an Indian when you see him, wherever he is. And that's why I say strategic alignment is not the answer. I mean, there, there are practical reasons also. The Chinese say distant waters don't quell fires at home, which 
is true. Uh, and I would not put India's security or risk putting India's security and at the door of somebody else saying they will act in order to protect my security. I think you are too big, too unique, and too different, actually, to do that. And that's a dilemma that you have. So people talk of Indian exceptionalism. It has a basis in reality. And unless you can show me somebody who shares those interests, uh, I find it very difficult. Look at, look at, I mean, you talk to the Indo-Pacific, which is not a term I, I think makes much sense. But anyway, you look at the Asia-Pacific. Everybody wants to be the balancer. But nobody is doing anybody else's work for them. Each one of us has a security dilemma with China, us in China, Japan in China. I mean, the US now is involved in the South China Sea. God knows where she's taking this. But no, nobody can be sure that the other one's interests are the same as his. When Japan got into trouble over the Senkakus, the Ayu, whatever, in the East China Sea, the first thing the US, who has a treaty commitment to protect Japan, and regards Senkakus as part of Japanese territory and says the treaty commitment applies, told the Japanese, don't make trouble. Be careful. Now, I'm very uncertain that you can actually find somebody. This is my basic objection to strategic, that, to strategic alignment, that, that I'm not sure that it actually helps us to either you know, transform India or to even defend India. I, I'm not sure that you can actually do that. So that's, I think, uh, when you say that I've kept back the why, you know, part of it is because most of these explanations of why we take decisions and that most, most memoirs and so on, frankly, are self-serving. They will all tell you we made all the right choices and these are the reasons why. But the reasons are all post hoc. Uh, <laughs> it's very, I don't know why people took certain decisions, as I said, these are personalities make these decisions. Ultimately, it's individuals. I'm no psychologist. And I, I find it dangerous, actually, to posit <coughs> policy on that kind of assumption that I can tell what kinds of decisions will come, where it goes. I think there is, there is a danger. Now, in IR, we, we invariably assume, at least rationalists assume, that you know, there is such a thing as rational, strategic <coughs> man, amoral, that he acts on his interests, etc. I think that's as much of a myth as, you know, rational economic man. Uh, it's, it's a combination of things. So I, I don't want to get into that man, but rational, okay, but then why all this foolishness in history, you know? <laughs> so, so there is a problem there with actually the why part of it. I, I thought of it, of, you know, of, but what do I think of Pakistan, Sri Lanka? Pakistan, I've said in the book that I, you know, first I thought that we should have responded. Now I think that was the right choice. Sri Lanka, as I say in the book, I don't think there is, it was right or wrong. It was a mini-max decision. You tried to minimize harm and maximize gain. And whether we achieve that will always be a matter of debate. In my own mind, I think those of us who were involved tried our best, and I think we did whatever we could. Could we have done something different? Nobody has actually given me an alternative of the things we might have done, which would not have had other consequences. I haven't seen an argument yet. That doesn't mean tomorrow it couldn't come. Maybe somebody has a better idea of what we should have done. So on Sri Lanka, you know, I'm neither here nor there. On, I, I still, I would rather keep an open mind on that. Because also it's not over yet. As I say in the book, the Sri Lankan problem that, that we, you know, we deal with only those last six months, and yes, that particular, but the basic problem that, and the dilemma that we were facing, that's still there. It's, it hasn't gone away. With, between Gota and uh, Mahinda Rajapaksa, you know, I didn't see it. And in practice, I mean, frankly, we, we dealt with both of them, and a lot of the time with both of them together, and I didn't see it in practice. I, I don't know whether you know, Frank, maybe this was good cop, bad cop, maybe, I don't know. But I, I can't speak from experience of it at all. About democracy and military rule, uh, I don't think there's a general rule that you can apply <coughs> either in the region or anywhere. I think in each case, it's, it's really local factors, do, indigenous factors that really make the difference. 
uh, from as an external actor, you know, your problem is do you take moral stances? I mean, you saw Myanmar policy. Sham is the right one to talk about this, actually, about the, your difficulty in do you, does the nature of the regime affect your, your, your attitude to it? Are you going to let it, or are you just going to go after your interests no matter who's there? Uh, you know, I think let, let Sham maybe answer that question because he knows it well. Uh, the, about, Suresh said about, you know, what choices do we have in a shifting scenario? I, I don't think we have, our strategic <coughs> choices have limited, no. I just said our strategic objective is still clear. The objective is, and I don't think we need to fiddle too much with that about transforming India. No, I, in fact, I actually think that space is opening up for powers like India in the international system because so much is changing. I mean, whether it's the economic balance, whether it's a military balance, whether you look at the function of the sole superpower, and clearly the old liberal Western, liberal Western <coughs> order no longer exists and no longer delivers either security or prosperity. I mean, that's why people are voting against it across the board, even in the West. I mean, it happened here much earlier, but <laughs> it's happening there later. So, uh, actually, I think you're at a moment, you know, at a real inflection point. I'm not sure that actually our strategic choices are more limited, but I do think you need to be careful about, you know, making big commitments one way or the other, or betting on the future. As you said, this is very dangerous <laughs> if you start saying, you know, this is what it's going to be like in three years, and five years. I think the levels of uncertainty that you're now facing are unprecedented. You haven't seen this since the Second World War, this level of uncertainty in the international system. That's not the time to make huge bets on individual relationships or on what the future is going to look like. Sure. The issue of um, uh, strategic uh, autonomy versus strategic alignment, I think uh, one important point that has been made is that uh, non-alignment uh, was really an instrument to ensure strategic autonomy at a certain period in our history. And I think during that particular period of our history, it was an extremely um, successful policy, to my mind. And uh, even though the circumstances may have changed and may require a different set of policies, uh, doesn't mean that we therefore throw the baby out of, with the bathwater, as it were. And because we are doing something different today, we say oh, everything that we did in the past was wrong. Because today it is not as relevant as it was. Uh, but strategic autonomy has not changed, to my mind. And I think we should, we should uh, not make the, make the mistake of uh, trying to link what is substance with what is the packaging. Uh, with regard to uh, alignment itself, uh, even Mr. Nehru uh, conceded that there would be uh, situations where we need to align, not necessarily ally, but align. And uh, from 1960 to 1990, we were aligned in many ways with uh, the then Soviet Union because it served our interests and because it also served Soviet, uh, Soviet interests. So uh, it is not a rigid sort of uh, assertion of uh, complete autonomy. As I said, it is the search for, um, uh, it, it, is, it is being able to uh, pursue your vital interests through relatively autonomous means. So this is uh, something which I, I don't, do not think uh, has changed at all as far as today uh, alignment with the United States of America in certain areas is is good for us. I believe it is good for us. And I agree with uh, Ronin that my own experience has been that we found China more amenable, more sensitive to our interests precisely because of the prospect that we may be moving closer to the United States. Not that it was provoking a hostility from. Uh, uh, I, 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 I usually make a point that your friends will take you for granted if you don't have many options, and your adversaries will turn the screws more on you if you do not have options. Therefore, it is very good to have as many options as possible, as many alternatives as possible. Good diplomacy, to my mind, is precisely to give you a range of options that you can use. So um, I don't think this is really a really a debate in a, in, a, in a sense, should we go in for strategic alignment or should we go for non-alignment? I think that's a wrong, wrong debate. Secondly, with respect to, uh, you know, um, 
should we should we not be more aligned in order to uh, safeguard our interests uh, we must make a distinction what is clear to me and i think it is clear to uh, my colleagues here that if india were to get into a war say with pakistan with china to expect that any of your allies will come to your defense i think that simply will not happen so you are alone in this business you have to take care of your interests which is the reason why you should be prudent in not provoking something which you cannot handle and you should learn from our own experience in 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 the past but it is also very useful for you to constrain the ability of any potential adversary by having as many as having a strong network of relationships with other major powers precisely for the reason that i mentioned so pursuit of closer closer relations with a whole cluster of major powers whether it is japan whether it is the united states whether it is australia whether it is even russia that helps you in managing what is an adversarial relationship for example with china if you did not have that network of relationship it would be more difficult to handle china but that does not mean that therefore you should be confident that if you got into a war with china somebody will come and help you no it's the same thing with terrorism to think that somebody else will pull the chestnuts out of the fire for you that simply will not happen at the end of the day you have to deal with it but in dealing with it if you can get pressures from several quarters also on those who are indulging in this so much the better so your expectations need to be somewhat more modest than sometimes appears to be the case that's that's uh, what 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 i would uh, feel is 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 good uh, diplomacy uh no i just uh, i second it you know i have say when you talking about choices and all that uh, and dilemmas prince of hamlet wouldn't have made a good king of denmark <laughs> prince of i mean denmark yeah sorry so i think uh, it has been summed up extremely well i have nothing else to add okay uh, general meta there are two questions basically uh the first question is that choices will be determined um uh, by capabilities and i don't find that capability creation uh as an integral part of the so called processes that you have underlined because you at the very outside said that one thing that has been lacking consistently and this can be elaborated uh by what india has experienced is implementation now if you just go back to 26 11 where you said what you said and then you said what you said uh what did i say you chain you said initially you said that we should not ex- we, we should have done it and then later on you said i think we did the right thing in you hindsight see the dangers of being honest yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you know when as as keen said when the facts change i change my mind what do you do <laughs> you know <laughs> i i state what you stated <laughs> uh so what is you look at 26 you look at the attack on parliament uh, what choice did we uh, implement we didn't have the capability 26 uh, 11 the national security adviser and you are known to have said that we didn't have the kind of capability no, sorry no, the, no. the national security adviser uh, mk narayan said we didn't have that capability in 2008 we still don't we didn't have the capability in 2016 although we did the surgical strikes for whatever they were worth very modest in their achievement so the question is where is the linkage between and i think you referred to it Uh, briefly between defense and foreign policy I, there is no integrated linkage between that cre- uh, capability creation and your choices because your choices will become unchoices or non choices as they have b- 
been in the last couple of years because you didn't have the capability. So that's the one question. My second is on timing. So may I request you to ask the question? We are going to run yeah, out just, of time. Yeah, yeah please, timing. Please very, very briefly. On timing of this, of, of choice, exercising choices, uh, would it be correct to say that what we were offered on, on China, forget what was offered in 1960, even in 1980, you were offered cho choices which are much better than what are being offered today. So what about this question of timing of exercising choices? Because today uh, you said that China takes you seriously. If it does, then when the prime minister of this country at a, at a summit says we should clarify the line of actual control, the Chinese president completely ignores him. Uh, Ambassador Valjeri, your turn will come, sir. We have a very long list. Huh? Ambassador Valjeri. To Ambassador Miron, I would like to thank him for giving me one tool to understand much better what happened in these uh, last years in the chapter. So I am in the final word. And when I am in the third or fourth page, and then while reading that, one quote from Lao Tzu come to my mind where he says, if you are depressed, you are living in the past. If you are anxious, you are living in the future. And if you are in uh, peaceful, you are in peace, it means that you are living in the present. But unfortunately, the present all over the world is unstable with uh, all these threats of uh, terrorism and other phenomena. I would like, if it is possible, from Ambassador Menon to give us what is the spirit of the inside, the making of India's foreign policy now between, I mean, the three things, which are depression, anxiety, <laughs> or peace. Thank you. <laughs> good question. Shankar, uh, illuminating book. I've gone through every bit of it. Thank you for writing it. But my question is, little derived coming from the book and and the presentation you made here about the choices. Recently, two statements have been made. One, that we have been pulling our weight, pulling punches below our weight. That statement has been made by the responsible quarters. And second is about the nuclear doctrine, no strike option. Now, these two statements, do you think some choices are being made in policy? Or they are innocuous, one of those statements which somewhat sometimes slip out? Yes. <laughs> I like this book, though I have not seen this book, and I have not read this book. <laughs> <laughs> it is based on that I was carefully watching the TV, your interview on this book, which made me to come and uh, listen what you say. My first question is uh, that during the entire discussion, the weightage, more weightage has not been given to India-Pakistan relations. Number two, do you think that stopping the dialogue or no, no dialogue serves any purpose? Third question is, that this present government, whatever our traditional policies were there for the last 80 years for Israel, now we have shifted our stand or tilted our stand, or do we think that we are going to change our entire foreign policy, or do we have, do the present government has any foreign policy? My name is K.L. Malhotra, I am a social activist. 
and my last point is watching the statements of rss chief and others they talk about one objective that is we want to be the most powerful nation of the world so the choice between powerful or welfare, welfare state how do you analyze this thank you i think we'll, you take them now and Should we have one last yeah. out here mm -hmm. you know your question about yeah what what about building capabilities and stuff yeah, i'm not quite sure what you said is accurate because it depends capability to do what I think by 2008, we had more capabilities than we had in when Parliament was attacked, 2001. And certainly, we today have much more than we had even in 2008. So I think when uh, Mr. Narayan was speaking, he was speaking to a specific question about a certain kind of capability. And I don't want to get into what we have, what we don't have. I don't think we should get into that. And frankly, it's not, you know, it's not something that we need to worry too much about. As since I am now a member of the general public, I don't think that's true. But the fact is that our capabilities have increased over time. I mean, there's no question of that. This is why we have so much more agency in the system. This is why we have the ability to do things in our periphery, which we never used to do in the past. And you can see it. You can see it in very simple in our military diplomacy. You can see it in what the Navy does in the region. You can see it in a whole range of fields. I mean, the, our ability to supply power to Bangladesh, for instance. We couldn't do this 10 years ago. But these are all different kinds of capabilities. And I think this whole question of which capability do you have the capabilities, I think we need to be much more clear about what capabilities we need. And that depends on exactly what kind of power you want to be. You know, you, you said this question, do you want to be the most powerful in the world? I would say I don't mind being most powerful if that is what actually serves the welfare of the people of India. If that makes us secure and actually makes the Indian people prosperous and safe. But frankly, absolute security for any one state in the international system means absolute insecurity for everybody else. And I don't think that's a recipe that will last for very long. I mean, the, the natural reaction will be tremendous. So on the capability question, I'm not, I'm not really sure. We did create an NSC after Kargil. And those are attempts to change the processes and to create capabilities and to actually create the kind of coordination across various institutions. Some of what you were saying between defense, foreign policy, some of that actually happens through the NSC. In fact, a lot of it happens. It's the only organization we have in the government of India which is staffed by military people, by people in uniform, by civilians, civilians of all kinds, by diplomats, you name it, scholars, everybody in the NSC. And that's why we created it after Kargil. And it worked the third time. We tried before twice, but it worked the third time. And so I wouldn't be quite so pessimistic or make such a sweeping statement that there's no capabilities and we're exactly where we were. In fact, we're not where we were. I think that has changed considerably. Timing, you know, timing, yes, maybe there were Chinese offers in 1960, in 1981, 82, actually. Uh, but, you know, they also timed it very badly if they were looking for an Indian acceptance. <laughs> I, so, I mean, timing cuts both ways. The fact is that you need to be both be in phase if you want to. And you have dealt with the fact of not having a boundary settlement and managed the world's largest boundary dispute by concentrating on peace and tranquility. And you've done that successfully for 30 years. It's your most, most peaceful border. Least defined, most peaceful. Most defined with maps signed by DGMO of lines is where you see firing, shelling, infiltration, cross-border terrorism, you name it. So. Uh, I would rather look at the outcomes, at what's actually happening on the ground, and deal with that, rather than worry too much about the general question of, of you know, the, the timing and so on. Of, obviously, it's a judgment call. You have to choose when you want to act, when you ch try to pursue your goals. Uh, on Laos, uh, you're quite right. Uh, he does say this, and it is true. We, you know... <laughs> I suppose you need a mindful foreign policy. I mean, you need to be concentrated in the present. And it's, it's actually a very, that's a very deep point you've made, because the world keeps changing. 
And if you're not mindful of the present, if you're still looking back, saying, oh, I missed a chance, I should do it now, or, you know, oh, watch out, in the future it's going to get worse, let's do... You actually confuse yourself thoroughly. And the basis has to be what the Buddhists call mindfulness, I think, <laughs> to, to start with. But, but, you know, that's a huge, that's a, at least one PhD thesis, if not more, <laughs> in, in what you said. About punching below, our, with nuclear doctrine, I actually owe the gentleman who raised questions thanks, because, you know, this <laughs> book has a chapter on 2611 and cross-border responses and military responses. One week before it was released in the U.S., our government did a surgical strike. So that made it very topical. One week before it was released in India, the government made statements, or at least a senior minister made statements about no first use. And there's a chapter on no first use. So I'm very grateful to them for these statements. But how much they mean and whether they will translate into policy, they have to say. And that's also my answer to you. I cannot answer for this government. I'm, I'm not part of government since 2014. And frankly, what they choose to do is, is their business. They're in charge and they're responsible. And I, I you know, I... I think if you read the book, the last bit, I think it says what I think of, of what kind of policies and what kind of power we should be. I think I make it clear what I think. Uh, but the rest, I'm not sure. About India-Pakistan relations and dialogue, I think it's a false choice that, you know, if you stop talking, terrorism will stop? No. If you do talk, terrorism will stop? No. I, I think this is, you know, a false binary. There's you talk if it's in your interest to talk if there are things you want to do. I think it is in your interest because, frankly, you're dealing with many Pakistans. And not all those Pakistans are inimical to you. Certainly, the ordinary Pakistani is not. The Pakistani businessman is more than happy to do business with you. Civilian politician, this way, that way, some. But when it comes to the core establishment, to the ISI, to the Pakistan army, there is an in built-in institutional interest in hostility with India. So you can't run one Pakistan policy to deal with all these Pakistans that you're dealing with. And that's part of the problem, which is why talking, travel, these things, trade, are useful for the first two, three that we talked about. But it's not going to solve your problem with four and five. And those parts you'll have to deal with separately. You have to do counterterrorism at the same time as you're doing dialogue. But I think it's wrong to say, should we do one or the other? It's not an either or problem at all. No, I think, uh, I, think uh, I agree fully because, you know, what's happened is I think we have, in fact, one thing I think Shankar has been quite frank, that we should stop outsourcing this to Punjab and its colonies, including <coughs> Delhi. Uh, you know, because it does not reflect the aspiration in India. We are, we are, we are actually, you know, we are too obsessed with our third largest neighbor. You know, either love, hate, you know, jap, uh, what is it? Jappi. Jappi and Jappi. What, I mean, that's a ridiculous kind of thing. It's an accident of history we are located here. So I, I'm glad that uh, is, uh, some balance has been maintained. Yeah. Not Punjab's <laughs> That's what I think. <laughs> no? Okay, we have one last lot of questions and then we'll see. Uh, Dr. Borkan. Ambassador Shankar, I just wanted to um, commend you for bringing out this book because uh, I found the flu, the flow, uh, you know, as per expectations. So I don't tend to agree with your son-in-law who said it was shockingly readable. <laughs> I mean, it came up to my expectations. Thank you. Uh, the question I wanted to ask you was that, uh, uh, you see, is uh, uh, the word consensus now outdated? You know, and uh, uh, then uh, how, in your narrative, how would you put... Uh, Partisan, non-partisan, national interest. I mean, these things are uh, uh, now, uh, you know, opening up a lot of questions. Thank you. Vijay Nayak. So you have, uh, Mr. Menon, uh, you have uh, partly uh, answered the question in Pakistan, but I just wanted to ask you, you talked about India-China relations, and you said that we have been able to manage the differences because of the uh, peace agreements which we, we had. Uh, do we have uh, any choices so far as Pakistan is concerned, actually? Are our choices very limited now with Pakistan? And uh, as, as the other gentleman said, that the, we have come to a standstill so far as the talks are concerned. So our choices have become very limited to Pakistan. And what, how do you see future of relations? Thank you. Ambassador Sarwar. 
once again like to congratulate Ambassador Shivshankar Menon uh, and thank him really for sharing with us the how of these very five of these very important five uh, choices, decisions, dilemmas, whichever way people would like to see it, and perhaps why it can be a matter for another day. Um, secondly, the choice itself of the these five defining moments, I think, is very instructive because I don't see that they are necessarily have to be success stories. I think in each case, probably they are not. And I think that's what makes the book really worth, uh, it, it, it's an education for those at least who are, who are and have been and are still, I think, interested in being practitioners or in following the theory. Um, just one or two points, if I may be permitted, one on a lighter note and one, I think, taking advantage of Ambassador Rodinson's presence, if I may be permitted to ask. One on continuation of what Ambassador Shamsaran said and um, Ambassador Surinder Kumar's comment on my, um, my concern and anxiety at the unease that China has. I don't, of course, share here uh, Ambassador Menon's optimism. Just to share an anecdote will give us an, an insight into how Chinese look at things, though there are ways of dealing with them. Leaks was one such thing. In 1978, nine, when just before Foreign Minister Vajpayee's visit, I was there as a very junior officer, had a terrible car accident. My car was packed up. I was badly injured and wounded. And what was wonderful was that they told Ambassador Darayanan before that, because he had left before the visit, that you know, because of our impending friendship and the visit of Mr. Vajpayee, we are not leveling a case against your second secretary for breaking down the tree uh, with which she was so badly hurt. So please remember, I think that there's anything and anything that they would, they would use as a leverage and they would use it to advantage. But of course, having said that, there have been, there have been missed moments, missed opportunities. And I would say, um, I think it's futile to go into timing, but yes, uh, there can be mismatch, I think, of moments and moods and so on. And I think in this process, we are continuously engaged. I am tempted to ask Ambassador Ron in sense, since um, the Soviet factor, I think, since the 1993 very defining uh, agreement and which has given us really this peace and stability followed by the agreement in 96, um, comes really from an unfinished business of Rajiv Gandhi's visit, I think. It is a sort of an unfinished mandate, I think, which should have been followed, but as you said, it could not be. Rajiv Gandhi's visit itself, and this is where you can shed some light, I think, comes after Gorbachev's Vladivostok speech, where he said the Sino-Soviet relations are going to be the major trend of the times. And I think we were encouraged to think that we are going to settle and it's time you also do. So to what extent, because we know that it did have an inhibiting role in the earlier period, uh, it would still be interesting, I think, since uh, we still think of strategic alignments and so on, to, to the extent the role of the Soviets in, um, in the pace that was taken, and then, of course, ultimately the success of the Rajiv Gandhi visit, because that's also for 93, that we recognized we were on the same page as the Chinese, and which is why probably it was easy for us to move together. And just last, Nalin, just last, that's on a very personal note, um, Ambassador Menon's tribute to Mrs. Mohini Menon in the book is one of the most moving, the best anybody, any author can give, I think, to his spouse, and I should like to recognize her for that. Thank you. Dr. Sanjeev Kumar. Uh, sir, the uh, importance of 1993 agreement between India and China has rightly been uh, highlighted here. My question is about the 2005 agreement. I think it was an uh, extremely important agreement simply because both countries agreed for a common political parameters to settle the boundary question. Now, in 2005, after this agreement, it was felt by many uh, uh, scholars that the boundary question would be resolved. Uh, my question is whether you share this assessment, and if not, what could be the reason for delaying boundary uh, resolution? Ambassador uh, Sain has referred to the Indo-US deal as a could-be factor, whether you agree for that. Thank you, sir. Well, about consensus, you know, I think we wear rosy spectacles when we look backwards at foreign policy in India. And we always say we used to have consensus, we all, which is not true. We've never agreed on Pakistan policy. We've never agreed on China policy. If you look at some of those debates in, in parliament between 59 and 62, and even after 62, I mean, it, 
there was, there was blood on the floor. Uh, U.S. policy. Uh, these have all been very contentious domestically, politically. But I think that's normal. As I like to say to Chinese friends, we do in public what you do in private. Mm. And we argue about these things, but a democracy should. If we don't argue about these things, frankly, I mean, we'll end up in the wrong places. If we start just accepting, you know, one, two people's word that this is the way it's going to be, especially in foreign policy, because all the actors you're dealing with are outside your control. It's not like domestic policy, and really the le uh, levels of uncertainty are so much higher, there's no enforcement of international law. So I think you really need to look at it slightly differently. The problem is, and I think most good leaders have recognized that you need to build that consensus around foreign policy because it makes implementation and better, but it also makes other people take you more seriously. One reason why, I mean, I describe in the book how you know, Prime Minister Narasimha Rao insisted that we consult various people within his own camp, but also outside, while we were negotiating the agreement. And not that we had an agreement or anything when we started. And I asked him, what do I tell them? I have nothing to say. He said, no, just go and ask them what we should do. But it was a way of co-opting them and then talking. To, and some of the best ideas actually came from Mr. Vajpayee, who was in the opposition then, was the leader of the opposition. So. I think that part of the process, I think, is very important. If you want to make foreign policy well, I think you need to go through some internal consensus building, you know, nemawashi, as the Japanese say, which I think is something that maybe we risk losing when we, we start, you know, I, I, I don't get the sense that we're doing quite as much of that as we may be used to. And as Ronan said rightly, a lot of that was actually within the ruling party. Maybe it's going on now. I don't know. I, you know, I can't comment on the present. On uh, Pakistan and the limited choices that we have, you know, my own sense actually, and I say so in the book, is that we're really in for the long haul in Pakistan because until something fundamental changes in the f structure of Pakistan, and I don't see that happening, uh, I think we're going to have to deal with cross-border terrorism and so on. But you know. I'm, I don't, that doesn't mean to me that we are going to be stuck where we are today, uh, forever. We've been there before. We've gone through this cycle of euphoria and then, you know, complete depression, terrible, impossible. And then we go back, we start talks, and then, you know, it gathers momentum. Then again, you have a big attack. I mean, it sort of feeds, and this dance, you know, I think both sides know. Uh, question is, how do you break out of it? And I'm not sure that I can see any factors of change most important structurally within Pakistan, which, which can lead to that kind of, that kind of hope. Uh, it's, I think Neelam's right, and these are not necessarily uh, success stories, and I'll, I'll leave it to Ranan to answer you about uh, the Vladivostok speech and the Soviet attitude throughout this process. About the 2005 agreement, you know, all these subsequent agreements, the uh, 1996, the military CBMs, all of these were actually foreseen or at least presaged and made possible by the 93 agreement, which is why I think it, it played a foundational role, including 2005. But 2005 took it a whole step further because it actually dealt with the boundary settlement itself. Now, the the way it was envisaged was a three-step process, was from the general to the particular. You do the guiding principles and political parameters, which we agreed in 2005. And this supports Sham's point that just as we were doing civil nuclear with the US, China was ready to do this with us. And that therefore these are mutually reinforcing rather than mutually exclusive things. Uh, after that, we were supposed to agree on the framework for a boundary settlement, and then reduce the framework, the guiding principles and the framework into a, into a line on the map and the ground, ultimately. And that, that was the way in which it was envisaged at that time. Uh, I, we've gone more than halfway through the process of drafting a framework. I can't tell you where we are today, because I'm not part of that anymore. So, but will we settle? I think when we do settle, ultimately, whenever it is, it will ultimately, we will go back to the guiding principles because they do lay down a set of agreed principles between us. But whether we will settle quickly or not, I'm not sure. As long as both sides are convinced that the future belongs to them, that their negotiating <coughs> position is going to be better in the future, it's unlikely that they'll settle today. 
And that seems to me the situation as of now. Yeah, uh, Neelam, uh, your question about uh, Vladivostok speech and, uh, uh, and about uh, Russia or rather Soviet-China relations at that time. I just referred very briefly to it, you know, because, uh, you know, in this audience everyone knows, and you certainly know, that uh, the Soviet positions had changed, and it had changed from, even before Gorbachev, actually the transition from uh, Brezhnev Suslov to Andropov Gorbachev. Chernyko was just a punctuation mark. But, uh, so that was a profound change, and so there was much closer understanding between both the Soviet Union, the Soviet leadership, and the Chinese, as well as between the Soviet leadership and the Americans, than people here realized. We were so busy with mandir, masjid, and mandals, and everything, we just forgot what really happened, what was happening, and we made mistakes, like in the, uh, what is it, fueling, restops, etc. Colossal mistakes you know, reaching out, going on a visit to Moscow and stopping by in Tehran. There were much more, much closer interaction than what our people realized. So given uh, that factor, and also that things are not, you know, frozen forever, as Shankar said, and, you know, Sham pointed out so well, that it's a very dynamic position. And, uh, and we can't have, you know, suppose we had a framework your framework, what would be your framework? Like Shankar pointed out, there's so many Pakistans, for instance. For instance. My own experience was at that time, and let's say our experience was that it was comparatively, I mean, it goes against all established uh, theories, frameworks, that you found it easier at that time to deal with uh, Zia ul Haq. And we have opened up a dialogue with, uh, I mean, the, the designated person, Hamid Gul. So, you know, we shouldn't just come at conclusions and then try to, uh, you know, uh, we have to be much more flexible. And at the Vladivostok speech was also reflecting that. It was fundamentally different to the Brezhnev collective security. In fact, in fact it was more the Helsinki principles, but that was unfounded because the, India was not Europe, Asia was not Europe at that time. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, just wanted to <coughs> last word, as it were, uh, the, on the issue of uh, consensus. Uh, Shankar pointed out that um, Narsimha Rao, uh, you know, encouraged him to brief uh, other political party leaders and sometimes even within the party uh, in order to create uh, a broad consensus on. Uh, but sometimes uh, that doesn't work, which is what happened with the nuclear deal. That uh, <laughs> Dr. Manmohan Singh did try very hard. Uh, to reach out to the BJP and other parties to build some kind of consensus. Uh, I was sent around several times to brief um, Mr. Vajpayee and some other BJP leaders uh, who agreed with me in private uh, that this was good for India, but uh, it did not help in terms of uh, getting political consensus. So sometimes it does not work. Uh, we've had a very fascinating two hours friends. I think it uh, behoves us to give both the author and our discussants a very hearty round of applause.